right, so without any further ado, I will go ahead and pass this over to Carolyn. Hey, good morning, guys, or I guess it's afternoon. I can't tell, it's still so dark here. Feels like morning still. Um, okay, so we're gonna dive into first OSHA and COVID and then just the plain OSHA rules, especially as it deals with COVID. Um, we're gonna go through, so everybody's heard that there's this mandate. So the first question, can you go to the first slide, Chelsea? Does everyone in my construction company need to be vaccinated? And that kind of depends. So can we go to the next one? Okay, so let me say that this mandate that's coming out that everybody's heard about, it's either federal projects or 100 employees is going to be regulated by an OSHA mandate. So what that means is that it's going to be an OSHA rule that if you're in violation and there's an inspection that you could be fined. So that is how it's going to be you know, presented and how it's going to be enforced. And as as we know, um, OSHA, I think right the last the last statistics I saw was there's one OSHA inspector for every 80,006 employees. So um, don't be wrong, we need to make it part of our business practice. I mean, of if you're gonna be in, if you have over 100 employees or going to be working with the federal government. Um, and so those are the two ways that you would have to have any everybody vaccinated. And we're gonna dive into it a little bit more in the next slides. Okay, so over 100 employees have to be vaccinated. Um, there is a um, exemption for this for religion reasons. L religious, I can't talk, hang on. Religious reasons, but if you don't do that, then you have, if you don't get vaccinated, then you have to get tested weekly to make sure you have a negative test. Um, if your employees want to go get vaccinated, you need to pay them for the time it takes them to get take off and to go get vaccinated. Um, if they are if they're doing the weekly route, then you don't have to pay them for that. Um, and as I'm diving into this, although it's going to be regulated through OSHA, the actual law hasn't been written yet. So I'm going off of what they say the law is going to say, and when it actually comes out and they change a little bit, I think these are the general guidelines that we'll be looking for. So over 100 employees. Um, is 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 one thing that we need to watch out for what is more common that's going to affect i think smaller you know texas contractors is federal projects okay so generally speaking on a federal project or if you're working with the federal government in any way you're going to have to be vaccinated and there's absolutely no exceptions for this uh, you have to have show pr proof of vaccination and so how this works into a subcontractor is so the general is hired directly by the federal government, whether that's on like an Air Force base or airport or something that's a federal job. And in that contract between the federal government and that general contractor, it's going to require that you follow OSHA and that it'll probably have a specific requirement in there that all of the general contractors, employees and subcontractors be vaccinated and so then it goes from somebody who's working directly for the government when you sign a subcontract with a general contractor who is working on a federal project in most of those subcontracts they incorporate that prime contract meaning they the terms of the contract between the federal government and the general contractor are are attached to and incorporated into your contract as the subcontractor. So that means as a subcontractor working on a federal project, once this mandate is enacted, that all of your employees will have to be vaccinated uh, if you wanna continue to work on federal projects. Um, you'll have to have proof of vaccination. And so this is the, the next slide. So I don't know because material suppliers generally don't sign contracts if it would go down, if it would go that far down the chain. But if you're a material supplier directly to the federal government, I believe that that, that will be part of their terms and conditions of, of them, of you supplying materials to them is that all of your employees be vaccinated and have proof of vaccination. Uh, so something to watch out for. Like I said, it has not been enacted yet and we don't know exactly how, how much it's going to be enforced. Um, what I can tell you is that the current fine is somewhere around uh, $14,000 per violation. So it is going to be something that we're really going to have to look very closely at when the actual law does come out and who, you know, and how are we going to take control of this and, and what are we going to do? 
So let's go to the, the common asked questions on this one. Uh, religious exemptions, like I said, if you are in the group of required vaccinations because you are over 100 employees, this will be an exemption that one of your employees can have. If you're on a federal project, this is not, it's not an exemption. There are no exemptions. If you're going to work on a federal project, all of your employees will have to be vaccinated. Um, and so, so the question is, if an employee refuses, do I have to fire him? Okay, so here is your, your options, right? If you don't fire him, you're going to face getting caught and having a you know a thirteen thousand dollar violation for not having an unvaccinated for having an unvaccinated employee. I have seen one federal case where an employee did terminate um, an employee an employee because they refused to get vaccinated, and the court held that it was not wrongful termination. So what it looks like at first glance is that you wouldn't be liable as an employer if you had to terminate an employee because they refused to get vaccinated, at least under this OSHA rule. Um, and so once the your, your employee handbook, which we'll get into how it should be, it should be already updated for COVID, but once this new mandate comes out, the safety plans for OSHA um, should be updated to have this in here if it applies to you, right? Um, how will the government enforce these rules? Okay, so most likely it's going to be an OSHA violation. So if there's an injury or something that OSHA shows up, they're going to check to see if all these things are required, if they're met, or if, you know, if there is a complaint. So we can only imagine, but still, even on the OSHA violation, it would still just be, if you're under 100 employees, it's still just be, are you involved in federal projects? If not, then it doesn't really apply. If you don't do any federal projects at all and you're under 100 employees, you're good. And because our Governor Abbott just came out and said no Texas entity can require a person to get vaccinated, we're covered by you know Texas Public Works. Any business in Texas can't require an, an employee or a contractor to be um, vaccinated. That is the rule here. Unfortunately, that rule is not going to be strong enough to trump the federal government on when you have employees over uh, over 100 employees or are working on a federal project. So that's that's as much as I know without having the actual law written yet, um, basically from their guidelines. I, I imagine it will be pretty pretty much safe to this, um, pretty much close to the guidelines that they put out there. OSHA has already updated their guidelines once since um, COVID hit. And it means that as part of your safety plan, you need to do a hazard assessment on your office and your job site and come up with a plan to reduce the risk of the spread of COVID. Um, and this should be part of your current safety plan. So specific risk of exposure. Do you have people working close together? How are we going to, you know, what are some things that you can do to reduce the risk, you know, require mask? frequent hand washing, have hand sanitizer all over. These can be real practical things. As long as we have a written plan so that if somebody from OSHA shows up, it's part of our safety plan, you know, everything that you can think of, you know, there are companies I know that come in and sanitize once a month and we'll give you that. You could build that into your safety plan. Um, it's going to be based on your specific you know, your specific office and your specific job sites, but as long as we have something in place. And I know a lot of job sites already have their own requirements. And so even if you incorporated those requirements into your safety plan, that's something that can work as well. Okay, so we went over that one. Okay, all right. So that is kind of OSHA and COVID specific stuff. Now we're gonna go over OSHA just generally. So what do you do if OSHA shows up at your job site? or office. Okay, so most of the time OSHA is showing up in response to either a complaint or there was an incident. Okay, so even if they show up, you can require them to get a warrant once they show up. Sometimes they'll already have it, sometimes they won't. Uh, but just know that practically speaking, if you require them to be a have a warrant, they're gonna, it's going to be a more in-depth um, you know, inspection than if you didn't. So just one of those things to think about if you need some more time to get a safety plan ready and things that, you know, paperwork all in order, it might be not, not be such a bad idea. Um, so make sure that you know that, that you can have them 
have to have a warrant or just uh, do it voluntarily. Either way, it's, it's going to get done if somebody want, if an ocean inspector wants to come inspect. So they start with an open. The next slide, please, Chelsea. So the first thing the ocean inspector shows up, says I'm here to inspect, uh, and you can either at that, like I said, you can either at that point say get a warrant or okay, let's let's do this. And so they're going to be an initial meeting before they start the inspection, and they're going to review the specific complaint that you know, gave rise to the inspection or the specific injury that gave rise to the, um, to the inspection. They're gonna to speak to you or any designated employees you have that maybe know more about the specific incidents, the specific complaint. Um, and then you're gonna go over what areas can be inspected. And so this is kind of important. If you don't limit it to what they can go see, then they're gonna go see everything. But you can limit to uh, you know where the injury occurred or if there is a complaint where the complaint happened you know anywhere around there they don't have the right to go see everything and so at that point they're also going to um, ask for a copy of your OSHA records and your safety log which you can provide to that all time at that time and make sure you have everything ready uh, make sure you have your OSHA poster visible to all employees that's another requirement um, that you get you can request those and they get sent to your company for free so you can have them somewhere where everyone can see them. Okay, so you have this initial conference. We talk about the incident. We designate representatives. Okay, now we're going to do the actual inspection. Don't let the OSHA inspector walk through by himself. Go with him and go only to the selected areas you've already talked about that you're going to. Only answer questions that are asked. Don't volunteer information. And usually questions that are asked be answered with yes, no, or I don't know. I know some people like me get nervous talkers and to start talking, just be as, be, be comfortable with the silence. It can only help you. So, I mean, don't be rude, just be respectful. Yes, no, I don't know answers. You don't have to overproduce, just produce the documents that they're asking um, for you. If you have somebody that, if, he, if the OSHA inspector sees something that is a minor violation walking in your company that can walk along with you so that they can fix, you can have those fixed as the inspection is going on, that'd be preferred. That way there won't be a citation issued for something like that. So that's what's going on during the inspection. They can take pictures and videos. Uh, you might want to do the same so you have your own copies, uh, even if it's just something on your phone. Okay, so after the inspection, then there's going to be another meeting and they're gonna list all the notes and violations they found. Um, and so, and then you're gonna go through and say, okay, you know, yes, I'm sorry we fell down here, but we do have the safety plan and, you know, we're gonna make sure that it, everything's updated and, you know, in, you know, in accordance with the safety plan. Um, don't argue with them, just be respectful and listen. Um, if there's something that the inspector got wrong, you can point it out respectfully. If he disagrees, just drop it, leave it there. Um, and here's the here's the other thing to keep in mind is that this closeout conference, they're going to list a bunch of things, but that's not all that can be cited for, right? So after the conference, they're going to go review the video and and any pictures, and they could potentially come up with more things that you could be cited for. So just keep that in mind. So they're gonna they're gonna close out that meeting, and then at after that point in time. You can is when you would expect to receive an OSHA violation. Usually it's within 30 days or so. Um, and so what do you receive if you, what do you do if you receive an OSHA, OSHA citation? Okay, so the first thing is there you have a couple of different options, but they all, they both require that you do something within 15 days of receiving that notice. Um, and the, the other thing is that you have to put a uh, you know a notice of the citation in the area where you were noticed until it is fixed um, and then for you know some point of time thereafter so your options when you get the first notice you got 15 days to respond you go to the next slide and so here are some of the things that are the mo the 10 most cited things for osha uh, fault failure to have proper fall protection uh, the ladders put up incorrectly not correct safeguards. Safety training, the failure to have safety training is a big is a big one. Proper eye and face protection, hard hat protection, fall protection on scaffolding. These are the most common ones cited. So you know what you know what they're they're always looking for these things. So make sure you take a note of all that too. 
All right, so you get an OSA citation. You're going to, within 15 days, you're going to request both. You're gonna send both a notice of contest and a request for an informal meeting. And so, because you have to do both of those within 15 days. And so what, and an informal meeting is basically like a mediation where you get together with the OSHA inspector and see if you can come with, come up with a plan to reduce any fines, fix the violations, um, and get everything done. If you can't come to an agreement then, then you can move forward with your notice of contest, which is basically a mini trial where an administrative law judge makes a decision. Uh, most cases get settled before it goes that far. It does happen. Uh, if you get an OSHA, OSHA citation, I, at this point, I highly recommend you hire an attorney just because so you know your options and we cover all the bases and we have everything in order. Um, obviously, we're here to help you do that if you have issues. Um, but definitely, if you get to the notice of contest, you will you have to have an attorney to represent you. So that's what kind of what happens if after an OSHA inspection and if there's a citation. All right, so the safety plan, and why is that important? That's the next slide, Jesse. Um, so it's always important to have an updated safety plan because number one, you're legally required to. And of course, it limits your liability. So the first thing that's going to happen if there's an, ever an incident is that they're going to ask you for your safety plan. Um, not having one makes you look like you don't care about safety, which obviously raises the chances that of any fines or, you know, even in the civil courtroom, if you know, if you get sued, that it's going to look like you're not very serious about safety and you need to be punished for not being serious about safety. So uh, it's good to have as part of your employee handbook, um, if you're signing subcontracts or prime contracts with the owner, most of those contracts have built in that you have your own very own safety plan that they could ask for at any time. Don't be wrong, they have their own, but they want you to have your own for your guys. So not having it, one could also put you in breach of contract under your subcontracts or your prime contracts. And so the most current mandate that was issued on OSHA, like we went over before, is making sure you've done that, gone through your job site or gone through your office and done a hazard to set a risk assessment of the chance of spreading COVID and how you're going to reduce that. So next slide, please. Like I said, the OSHA inspectors usually show up and unannounced. They're going to ask for a copy of the safety plan. If not, it's one of the first violations that you'll get. So make sure, you know, and we offer safety plans as, as a flat fee as part of your, you know, employee handbook, which are, is another important thing to, ha to have happen. So if you're interested, let us know. Um, again, having a next slide, having the safety plan that includes the COVID, uh, the COVID updates will reduce your liability if something does happen, right? Um, I, there hasn't been any successful cases that I've seen of of somebody suing somebody for saying, "Hey, I got, I got, I got COVID at, at your office, or I got COVID, you know, at your job site," just because because they can't really be proved. I don't think it would be, the, I don't think a court would entertain that type of argument um, just because it, you can't prove where it came from. But still, if anything does like that does happen or you get a demand letter to have a safety plan, say, hey, we assess the risk. We put measures in place to make sure everybody was safe and that we would reduce the spread. So that needs to be part of your updated safety plan. All right, so that's my OSHA. And uh, I know it was quick and fast, but if you guys have particular questions, go ahead and unmute yourself, put it in the chat, whatever, however I can help. Um, I did get one privately from Monica. Will we get a copy of the audio as well as the presentation? Yes, both of those will be sent to you after the presentation. Do we have any questions for Carolyn regarding anything you heard today? You can always email me or call me later. Or I'll be around. We'll be sending Carolyn's contact information afterwards in case you can't think of your question now, but you come up with one a little bit later on. You're more than welcome to reach out to her with that information as well. Um, if you've got any questions, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself or send it in the chat. <laughs> Oh, All righty. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. I'm here if you have any other questions. And, you know, if we get the
mandate and things have changed, we'll do another one of these. And we'll give you an update on, on what's really going on. I don't know the time frame of when the mandate will actually be issued. I'm sure the administration is pushing to get it as soon as possible, but we don't have a timeline. Um, I just got a question in the chat really quickly, Carolyn. Um, we've got two in the chat. So uh, one of them is, can we file an exemption? And will that be acceptable? Or are you saying you can't have an exemption for federal contracts? Correct. There are no exemption for federal contracts. The exemption is only available for the requirement of 100 employees or over. And then the yes. next one we have in the chat is, where do you get the forms for the OSHA records and logs? I'm sure there's a place online. I know that we have them as well. Chelsea, I think we can get them from Jonelle, or Jonelle can tell you where to get them from exactly. Mm -hmm. So you can definitely reach out to us via the contact information that I'll be sending you all after the webinar, and we can figure out how to get those in your hands. I do think you can find them online too. Sure, I just don't know the exact website off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Great. Does anybody else have any questions for Carolyn today? I've got one question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, so with companies over 100 employees are working on, or let's just go with working on, on the federal contract, that all the employees have to be vaccinated. Okay, is that yeah. all the that are working on a construction project on, for that contract? Is it all employees for the whole company? It's the whole company. Okay. It, it's, as far as from what I can tell right now, it's going to be the whole company. Okay. All right. That's the only question I got. Yep. All righty. Let's see. We've got another one here in the chat. What is specific about OSHA 300 that it would require for a job or that it would be required for a job? I'm not sure off the top of my head. I don't know. But I can find out. Yeah, Heidi, you're more than welcome to reach out to us after this and we can get you some more information. It's a form, gotcha. All righty. Mm. All right, if that's all we've got today, thank you all for joining us. Hope you were able to glean some very valuable information. I will be following up with a copy of the presentation, Carolyn's contact information, and later, either today or tomorrow, we'll be publishing a video of the presentation to our YouTube page, and we'll be sending that out to you all as well. Thank you so much. Have a good one, guys.